You might think that it would be foolish or unnecessary maybe for Cooler Master to try and improve the brilliant NR200P Mini ITX chassis, but Cooler Master has other ideas because we have got a new version. This is the Cooler Master Masterbox NR200P Max. But before we dive into this review of the Cooler Master NR200P Max, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the like button if you enjoy the content. If you want to help support Kiguru, head over to the store and pick up some merch. And as always, if you want to check out the in-depth technical reviews, head over to the website. This isn't just a mini ITX case, it's more of like a, a package deal. Because as well as the case, you get a 280mm AO CPU cooler and a power supply included, all for the price of $319.99. Yes, $319.99 for a mini ITX case sounds like a lot of money, but when you take into consideration how much the parts would cost individually from somewhere like Amazon or Scan, you actually realize that it's pretty good value. I totaled up the parts separately and it came to around about £340 for the case, AO and the power supply. You also got to remember that Cooler Master is throwing in a PCIe Gen 4 riser cable as well with this NR200P Max and I've worked out that there's probably about £40 difference between a Gen 3 and Gen 4 cable. So. That's where I got to the figures. So if you want to buy all the parts individually, this is pretty good value. But like myself, you're probably thinking that all Cooler Master has done with this NR200P Max is taken the original NR200P, thrown in a new power supply, thrown in an AO cooler and Bob's your uncle. But that's not strictly true because there's actually been quite extensive work done to the chassis, changing the orientation and changing the layout of certain areas of the case to accommodate that AO and to hopefully improve performance. As I've already mentioned, you can pick up the Cooler Master Masterbox NR200P Max for $319.99 exclusively at Scan at the moment. When new stock arrives next year, will be available elsewhere. Currently, it looks like it's only available in this gray color, but knowing Cooler Master, I expect there'll be some color differences or Updates to the colour, maybe black outer, white, other colours as we've seen with the NR200P. Leo reviewed the NR200P and he was really quite impressed with it. So I just want to go over the changes really, have a look at what is included with this NR200P Max and just see what it's like to build the system inside, see if it's any different compared to the original, see if the thermal performance is improved um just yeah just look at it in the perspective of somebody that's going to be buying this case to build a system in and just see what it's like like the original the nr200p max is kind of a modular design so all the panels remove kind of in a specific order if you want to make it easy so the front panel clips off first and you can see behind that front panel you've got two 2.5 inch ssd mounts there's also a mount in here for DDC or D5 pumps, but the pumps will fit inside the case. Top panel can then be pulled off. On the original NR200P, you installed the 220 mil fans in this top panel. That's a little bit different with the NR200P Max because you can see the top panel is slightly different. This allows you to now install up to a 280 mil AO or up to 240 mil fans. Unclipping the side panels is pretty straightforward. They just unclip and lift out. One thing I do need to mention about this is if you don't quite get the panel lined up perfectly with these little black clips, if they're just a bit off center, you can actually push those black clips out and then they end up dropping inside the system. Just something I've noticed while I've been having a look at this case. So inside here, it's really neatly packed in. Got a bit of packaging there to protect things. There's a box of accessories. We'll have a look and see what's included in there. The uh, PCIe cable comes in that box. And then a bit deeper inside, there's some dense foam and that's protecting the CPU block for the AO. So you can just pull that out and then remove the foam. The AO comes pre-installed to the roof of the case. That is a custom Cooler Master AO with the third generation dual chamber pump. It looks like it's got custom length uh, tubing as well, so it quite neatly wraps around the power supply. And then you should quite easily be able to install that to the motherboard.
and also pre-installed to the case is the power supply as well this is a standard v850 cooler master power supply so it's an 80 plus gold rated unit but it has custom length cables and they've got like a it's like a textured finish to the wire as well so they look pretty neat and hopefully they should be the correct length to reach to where they need to be in the case. So obviously the main differences between the NR200P and the NR200P Max is the inclusion of the AO and the power supply. But there's also some subtle changes as well to the, uh, the actual chassis frame as well. So on the back you can see this rear panel that's different to the original NR200P. The power supply cable was at the top in the original, it's now down at the bottom. And you can also see there's nothing there to uh, allow for horizontal GPU. That's why the uh, Gen 4 riser cable is included. The top of the chassis is also different to the original NR200P. As you can see up here now, we can install up to a 280mm AO or 240mm fans. You can also install 120mm fans in there as well. There's mounting points for 120mm fans. The difference as well is Originally you would attach the fans to the top plastic panel, but now they screw directly to the chassis frame. Looking from the side of the case, you can instantly notice that the radiator stroke fan stroke hard drive bracket that came along the side of the case here in the original NR200P, that is missing in the NR200P Max. So that means you can't install a 3.5 inch drive here on that bracket. You still can install the 3.5 inch drive on that power supply shroud and Cooler Master has also added some holes on the floor of the case. So technically you could fit your 3.5 inch drive in the bottom there and have it installed there as well. You also notice that the motherboard tray sits slightly lower in the NR200P Max. That is obviously to allow for the installation of this 280mm AO in the roof of the case. That might make it difficult to install fans on the floor of the case now, especially with the motherboard being lower, but Cooler Master does say that you can fit two slimline 120mm fans down there, obviously 15mm thick fans. If you have a three and a half inch drive installed to the floor of the case, you're only going to be able to install one fan at this side. Uh, it does look quite tight down there though, especially considering that the GPU will also be sat lower in the NR200P Max. The fans that come pre-installed are these 240mm Cooler Master Sickle Flow fans. You can see they also got grills on them as well to stop any cables or anything getting in the way of the fan blades, which is good to see. Some of the cables from the power supply as well, they come pre-routed. So the uh, EPS power cables are already routed round and up into the top of the case, but the rest of it is just bundled up down here so you can route them however you need. So obviously being a mini ITX case, this supports mini ITX or DTX motherboards. It also supports quite big graphics cards as well, so you can get a three slot graphics card in here up to 336 mil long. I'll be testing that out later because I'm using a Palette GameRock 3070, which is quite a long card. It's a three slot card. So it'd be interesting to see how that fits in here. With Cooler Master adding that 850 watt power supply, they're obviously targeting the high-end enthusiast market. You could run any current generation graphics card on that power supply, even an RTX 3090 would fit in this case. So it's gonna be interesting to see how it deals with the thermals once we get a system built inside it. Just before I move on to building a system, just gonna have a look and see what we get in this accessories box. So there are a couple of extra cables, an extra Molex cable for the power supply, an extra SATA power cable as well. Also, you get a UK mains power cable. And as I've already shown, you get this PCIe Gen 4 riser cable. If you saw the original NR200P review by Leo, you'll have seen that all the uh, 2.5 inch and 3.5 inch drives they have like a, a screwless installation where you just screw these little pegs into the drives and then they push in place in the little rubber grommets in the case. So you get plenty of those as well. And then you also get a bag full of all the mounting hardware for the CPU cooler. So obviously the cooler will be compatible with all current uh, desktop platforms from Intel and AMD. I believe there's also a mounting kit for the upcoming LJ1700 Intel platform in there as well. In its default configuration, the NR200P Max comes with these vented side panels. They've got dust filters, 
that are removable if you want even more unrestricted airflow. You also get a box with a tempered glass side panel. The tempered glass side panel can be obviously swapped out for the side panel. So you can see inside the system, it's got a mild tint to it. I'm not sure how useful that tempered glass side panel is gonna be though. Since you're gonna be mounting this GPU vertically, it's gonna stifle airflow to the GPU fans. The only reason I could see you probably fitting that is if you uh, were daring enough to build a full custom loop in this side and had a water-cooled GPU. I'm not gonna be building a custom loop inside the NR200P today because I really wanna test the performance as it is in its default configuration. So I'll be using a B550i Aorus Pro AX Mini ITX motherboard. CPU is an AMD Ryzen 9 3900 XT 12 core 24 thread. Should be good enough to produce plenty of heat to test that CPU cooler out. Memory is 32 gigabytes of Corsair Dominator RGB Platinum. This is a two times 16 gigabyte kit, uh, 3600 megahertz. For storage, it's the 500 gigabyte Corsair MP600 PCIe Gen 4 M.2 NVMe drive. And then for graphics, it's the palette RTX 3070 Game Rock. To give you a better view of what's going on and to probably help me a little getting the motherboard in position, I've just removed the case floor. It's pretty easy to remove. There's just two screws here and then one at the back. The floor comes off and then another two screws here and here. Just hold the frame in place. So now it makes it a bit more open and allows you to get into the case. To install the motherboard, you need to move this bundle of cables out of the way get everything away from the side here because it is quite a tight squeeze. I've already installed the CPU and the memory to the motherboard. You can see you can just lower it in position and then line it up with the screw holes. So that's pretty easy actually. I was expecting it to be a bit more difficult than that. Motherboard fixes in place with four screws, one in each corner as normal. The CPU block that comes with the case that utilizes the stock AM4 mounting bracket, so there's no need to install a backplate to the motherboard. If you're using an Intel motherboard, you might want to install the backplate before you put the motherboard in position. But now we can install the M.2 drive. Probably a good idea now as well to start plugging in some of the front panel cables. So a USB front panel, front audio as well. To get the motherboard in place I had to just move the uh, EPS power connections but I have managed to push them back through this gap here and now I can just route them along the top here as well as the CPU fan header push them through that gap and then hopefully I can plug them back in again without too much drama but it is a bit of a tight squeeze this it is a tight squeeze but as you can see they're plugged in. And I've just managed to get a couple of zip ties on those as well. So they're pretty nice and neatly rooted around the back of the system. Just remove the memory just to give me a bit more space so I can plug in this 24 pin ATX power connection. And also I'm thinking with that memory removed, I might just try and tie some cables down out of the way. Side of the power supply shroud, it's got these cable management eyelets here. So I'm gonna try and get one or two of those onto this 24 pin connector, maybe just one on the corner there. Anything else that's there as well, I'll try and get that with the zip tie. To install the CPU block on AMD, 
You just need the AMD upper mounting brackets and then they're just held in position using two screws from underneath. Same process for the other one. Two screws hold it in position. Apply some thermal compound, I'm using this Arctic MX-5. Don't forget to remove the protective film. Lower your CPU block down in place on the CPU and then just tighten up the two thumb screws. Think it's safe to pop the memory back in place now. You can see the tubes for the AIO root round there nicely and fit back lovely inside those velcro straps. If you wanted to install a 3.5 inch drive at this point you would pop in the rubber grommets to the power supply shroud. Take the little pegs with the Phillips head, screw those into the bottom of the hard drive And then just pop the pegs into the rubber grommets and that's it, hard drive installed. Likewise with the two and a half inch drives again, just screw in the pegs, this time it's the ones with the flat head. Screw those into the bottom of your SSD. And then you can either install it on the front panel, like so, or move these grommets around. and you can install it on the power supply shroud. We should now be able to install the graphics card I think, so first I'm going to plug this riser cable in. There is just enough space to allow the front panel audio cable to go underneath that. To install the graphics card you need to remove this rear panel, so take out the two screws. And there's another two screws at the back. And that just pulls out from the back. I think I just need to remove two of these PCIe blanks. And then install the graphics card to the panel. And then the whole thing should slot back in position. Ah, before I screw that back in position, I might just want to route some PCIe cables up there. So I just plugged in both the PCIe power cables, graphics card now goes back in position. So just before I wrap this build up and put all the case panels back on, I just want to have a look at how much space we have actually got down here for fans. I mentioned earlier about this floor, that it actually is only fixed with a single screw at the back. The screws here hold this piece in place. With the floor clip back in place, we could try a few different fans to see what kind of space we've got. I've got a 140mm fan, I'm not expecting this to fit, it is just a standard 25mm thick fan. It does actually physically fit in there but there's no mounting points for 140s so that's out. I've got a slimline fan here so this is a 15mm thick fan. That easily fits in both sides. It's only a 92mm fan that but same thickness as a 120 so you could fit a, a slim 120 in there no problem. And then we've got a normal 120mm 
25mm thick fan. Now, it doesn't fit in at that side, it's fouling the PCIe riser, but plenty of space for it at the other side. So if you don't have a hard drive fitted on the floor here, you can fit a full size 25mm thick, 120mm fan there, but you are restricted to just a 15mm fan below the PCIe riser. So all that's left to do now is reassemble the case. So I've just screwed in this reinforcing bar, put the floor back on. I'm not gonna install a fan on the floor, to begin with because I want to do some thermal testing with the case in its default configuration. I might test it with a fan fitted on the floor later on. So clip the side panels back on. Top panel clips on as well. Just need to clip on the front panel and we're finished. And don't forget the dust filter on the bottom. So that's it, it's finished. I'm really impressed actually with how quick the build went. I was expecting it to be much more awkward than it was. For such a small case, there seems to be absolutely tons of space in here. It's probably one of the easiest mini ITX cases that I have ever used. Cable management, I don't think I only use like four zip ties in the whole system. Cooler Master's done a great job with the cable length, especially the hardware configuration that we've used. Cable length seem perfect. Routing of the cables, very easy. It's something that is usually quite awkward in a mini ITX build, so I'm really impressed with that. The current configuration, it should be all right just with those two fans blowing out, especially now that we've got the 280mm AO cooling the CPU. GPU's in a good spot with the perforated side panel. That should get plenty of airflow as well. So I'm expecting it to perform pretty well in thermal tests. Uh, it's good news as well that you can get a full 25mm thick, 120mm fan on the floor. You could potentially just run one or you could put two thinner 15mm fans in there. So there's an option there for like bottom to top airflow. I can't see how Cooler Master can improve this case much more. The only thing that I could think that is a possibility in the future is maybe making like a, an airflow version with a, like a perforated front panel and allowing you maybe to fit a couple of slim 92 mil fans or 120 mil fan in the front but it's probably not necessary but i'd still need to power this system on and do some thermal testing so for the thermal testing i want to first run the case in its default configuration so all the side panels top panel front panel fitted and the fans configured as they would come from the retailer you can see as well in the bios everything has been defaulted so Default CPU frequency. The only thing I have enabled is the XMP profile for the memory. To put a full thermal load on the system, I'll be running the Cinebench R23 benchmark in a loop and simultaneously running the Heaven benchmark for 30 minutes. That should give the system enough time to get up to its full steady state temperature. Temperature readings will be delta temperature, so that means that the ambient room temperature has been deducted from the actual temperature readings and we'll be using HW info to measure the average temperature throughout the test. Currently it's 22 degrees ambient in the room. After running the test with the case in its default configuration, I'm gonna remove one of the side panels, test again, and then try installing a fan down in the floor as well, see if that makes any difference to the thermal performance. And then I'll run the test again and we'll be able to compare the results. GPU is running at its stock frequency. I'm gonna leave the GPU fans on automatic so then we can measure any difference in noise levels. I've also set the fan speed to a fixed RPM and the AO pump is connected to the system one fan header and that is running at maximum RPM. When I install this fan, in the floor of the case, I'll also be running that at a fixed speed at 1000 RPM. Before we get on to discussing the results of these thermal performance tests, there's one or two things I just want to mention first. Before building this system, I'd not really paid much attention to the 3900 XT and to its thermal performance, so I thought I'd take a look at Luke's original review of this 3900 XT that has been used in this build. If you look at his review, you'll see that the average temperatures under loan during his tests are around about 75 degrees C. Looking at Luke's normal ambient temperatures, that'd work out to a delta of around 50 degrees C. Now, during my testing, I've seen on occasions the CPU temperature 10 degrees or more higher than that. So I was thinking that that might sound a little bit underwhelming, but then when you take into consideration that Luke was testing with the CPU on an open test bench, so airflow around the system will be much less restrictive 
and there would be less heat soak from the GPU in this system. The GPU is directly below the radiator. Heat is going to be blown up into the radiator. Maybe 10 degrees higher isn't that bad. So because of that, I wanted to try and determine whether the limiting factor of the thermals in this system was either a lack of airflow, so maybe a lack of intake. Don't forget, we've only got two fans in this system and they're both working as an exhaust. The only real intake potentially is through the GPU fans from the side panel. Other than that, there's nothing unless you add fans on the floor of the case. So I want to de determine whether it's a lack of airflow or more airflow would improve the thermal performance or whether the stock AO that comes with the system, whether that is the limiting factor. So as well as the test that I've already mentioned earlier, I added a couple more variables to the testing. The first one would be to remove all the panels. So basically making this an open test bench, albeit quite a, a tight and restrictive one. I also thought maybe I could swap out the 280mm AO, the stock Cooler Master one, and then install an Acetec 280mm AO as well to compare different AOs, and that tell me whether the AO is a limiting factor or whether a lack of airflow limits the thermal performance. So looking at the results then, we can see that the system ran at its coolest with all panels removed, which is no great surprise. I also added in another test with the fans running at maximum RPM, and you can see there's nothing really between the Acetec and the stock Cooler Master AO performance is virtually on par with each other. With the Acetec AO running at 1200 RPM, you can see there's a slight improvement in thermal performance compared to the stock cooler running also with the fans at 1200 RPM. Removing the left-hand side panel offered a slight improvement, again, obviously giving the AO slightly more air to breathe. And then with the tempered glass panel installed, CPU temperature was at its highest. Installing the tempered glass panel had the biggest effect on the GPU temperature. And surprisingly, installing a 120 mm fan as an intake to the floor had a negative impact on CPU temperature. Maybe the intake fan was blowing more hot air towards the AIO radiator. And then in terms of the noise levels, it's a pretty quiet system overall, no matter how you have it configured, but it looks like the default configuration is tuned well to the system. 47 decibels, it's not too noisy, it's not too distracting. Adding the tempered glass panel does increase the noise level significantly, and also it has quite a big impact on the GPU temperature, so I'd probably suggest not running the tempered glass side panel unless you really need to see inside the system. Taking into consideration that this is a very small, small form factor case and the fact that everything is really crammed in, there's not a lot of breathing space, there's not much intake, so you don't get great airflow through the system. I don't think on average of 10 degrees C higher than in an open test bench, I don't think those CPU temperatures are too bad. The peak CPU temperatures during the test hit around 91 degrees C with the tempered glass side panel installed, but in all the other configurations, we're looking at around about 85 degrees C or mid 80s on the CPU. GPU temperature was great throughout. We're looking around about 60 degrees maximum on the RTX 3070. So I don't want to be too negative on the thermal performance because I think as a whole, this case at least is absolutely brilliant. Cable management works really well. It was really easy to build a system inside as well. I was very surprised at how quickly I was able to get this system together. The fact that the AIO and the power supply are already installed and those cables are really nicely routed. Great cable length. It does help with the speed that you can build the system. But yeah, overall, I think it's a great small form factor case. Probably one of the best out there. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you've enjoyed this review of the Cooler Master Masterbox NR200P Max. If you have, don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. Also, if you want to help support Kikuru further, head over to our store and pick up some merch or you could even subscribe to our Patreon. And as always, if you want to catch up on all the in-depth technical reviews, head over to the website.